Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. And one of the reasons that we uh, are not meeting here on Wednesday and Saturday and Wednesday um, is very specific that I need to, to talk to you about. Also, can I encourage you, please engage next Saturday with this process. We just thought with so many away and so many of the leaders of the house going to be absent that it was a good way to do it. So fellowship together, you know, love together, live together, bless somebody uh, next Saturday and, uh, and it's good. Um, but one of the reasons that we're away is I will explain. I, I have to take you back a little bit on this story. Um, 32 years ago, uh, we were not in this building, but the building that we were in when I was at those times um, playing the keyboard in the Sunday morning service, I, I heard God speak to me very clearly. Now, I, I don't use that phrase lightly or, or to try and, um, try and trumpet something being more important than it was. I heard God speak as clearly as I'm speaking to you now. There was nothing, nothing weirdly mystical, here's a code, work this out. Uh, it was as clear as I'm speaking to you now. And God spoke to me about a place that I'd never heard of, um, in a location that I wasn't aware of, uh, and a plan that I had never hatched. And uh, what God said to me is, I want you to go to a town called Scotts Bluff in the state of Nebraska in the USA. Totally unaware, didn't know the place existed. Um, that's all I heard on that day, and you know, my heart was pounding out of my chest because it was just like, just like I said it to you now, as real as that. There was no, mm, I don't, you know, did I make that up? I don't know. Was that? Did I really? It was like as clear as that. So the first thing I did was I, I went home and um, uh, uh, pulled out a map to see whether there was such a place in such a state in such a location and uh, as I looked on the map my heart started to pound even harder because there on the map there's not many towns worth locating on a map of the USA in Nebraska um, you know it's mostly plains and, and farming but but there on the western end is this this I read these words Scott's Bluff and uh, subsequent to that, God began to speak just as clearly again, and he spoke to me about when you're 30 years of age, um, I want you to go and take your family to this town. And uh, he began to speak to us uh, about many things that we would experience and what we were, what we were going to, uh, uh, to see. And so, two, not quite two years later, but on, uh, in March of... 19, of, of uh, 86, 1986, which is 30 years ago, okay? Um, we jumped on an aeroplane with uh, three suitcases and a three-year-old, which was Joel. Joel? Three suitcases and a three-year-old. And turned up in this little town in, in, in western Nebraska. Uh, it's a community with its, with, across a river of about 25,000 people. We turned up there, didn't know anybody, nobody knew us. We just, we'd heard God, we just went. And um, subsequent to that was a whole series of, of amazing uh, events that one could only describe as miraculous. Um, right down to us finding a home. What, what is remarkable is I actually chose the home that we eventually lived in before I ever knew it was on the market or ever saw it in the newspaper or ever phoned a guy to see where this place was. I'd driven down there and said, Lord, I want the right place for my family. Pick this apartment out. That same night in the newspaper was a number about an apartment for rent, no address. I called the number. The guy said, I'll meet you there. He said, where is it? He said, it's in Berwick Court. 
So I met him in Berwick Court, which was the place I'd just left three hours earlier, where I'd said to God, if we're going to live anywhere, I've looked at other places, but this is the place. I even picked out the apartment, the second two blocks facing each other, the downstairs apartment to the left of the stairs I picked out. Lo and behold, when the guy came, he said, this is the apartment over here, took me to the very place that I'd picked out three hours earlier, because when God says something, he cares about you, okay? So many things like that happened. Also, also God had spoken to us that in six weeks of arriving in the, the town that I, I would be the, um, the senior pastor of a church there. Now, that in itself is a crazy story because nobody knew us. Imagine, imagine six weeks from now, you just finding somebody who's turned up four or five times and saying, we'd like to make you the pastor of our church. Well, that's literally what happened to me now. If it was a church of 10, 15 people, you say, well, you know, you just roll the dice. You know, we, we couldn't get anybody anyway, so, you know, I guess he'll do. But this was a church of 300 plus people with the staff. Remarkable miracle. And so I finished up, along with Chris, um, leading First Assembly of God in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. God t told us to only stay for a year. During that year, um, we saw all kinds of miracles. God had spoken to us about who would be in the church. We met those very people exactly as described. The building itself of the church uh, had been seen in a, in a vision, and it was exactly as I'd been seen in the vision. Everything matched up. We went in there. There was a situation God spoke to me about the moment I arrived, which nobody in the church knew about. Um, but God spoke to us, and we were part of the process because then the leader was struggling. He was in trouble. He was moving. We were in. Anyway, it became, it became, um, it became a wonderful place of, of discovering and proving that the goodness and the faithfulness of God, and also um, finding our own abilities and weaknesses and and, and level of faith and. And, and the promise of God. And so every little detail um, came to pass. So if you ask me why I believe in prophecy and why I believe in God speaking to people, it's because every single detail that God spoke to us about that place was 100% accurate. I kid you not, Chris is here. There's people I can get you to call to ask. 100% accurate. Now, the accuracy wasn't on my part. The accuracy was on, on God's part. We were just taken along for a, for a journey. That was, that was very formative in, in mine and Chris's journey of, of, of who we have become as people and, and part of the equipping for us to walk through some of the challenges and, and difficulties and blessings that, that we have experienced since then. I don't believe that those things happen in our life just because God gets up one day and thinks, I'm really bored. Um, I'd kind of like to do a living story, so I'll pick a couple of people and do something. I, I believe those things happen for a purpose. And I do not believe that the purpose of those things uh, fades with the process of time. Okay? Um, the Bible says the promises of God are yes and double yes. The word it uses is yes and amen, which means so. The promises of God are yes and double yes to those who believe, which means that when God gets involved in our lives and we become the beneficiaries of promise, that promise does not disappear in the wind just because stuff happens, okay? Now, part of our job is to stay within the outpouring of that promise that is on our life, just like with the story of the children of Israel. So that, that, that was then. Um, what was remarkable was we'd been back some time since and we, we, we left a community of people there, but that wasn't our reason for being there. We came back to York having spent a year there. It wasn't our responsibility to dictate their future, although we maintained some relationship. Um, but anyway, in the journey to where we are now, what was interesting is a few weeks ago... Um, Chris, Chris suddenly came in to, to me at, at home and said, have you seen this? And um, uh, she had, she's, she's not a technocrat and she's not a technophobe. She kind of sits somewhere in the middle of those two things now. Um, 
so I know, I know she would struggle to manufacture anything on an electronic item. But she came into me and she said, look what just popped up on the screen of my iPad. And this is what popped up. Okay. Not that. Okay. Not that. That's what popped up. Um, and I said, well, so what? Well, um, what was interesting is this popped up. You, what, were you, what were you looking for at the time? Wreaths. She was Googling for wreaths, right? So it wasn't even like, that sounds like wagon. <laughs> so accidentally this came up because it's pretty close. Wreath, wagon, very... So obviously, the, there was no legitimate reason for this happening. Also, neither had Chris been looking for anything at any time ever um, on her Google search remotely relating to this picture. Um, what's significant about it is, is this is a Conestoga wagon that sits in front of Scott's Bluff. That's part of the pass that is attached on this side to what is known as Scott's Bluff, from where Scott's Bluff, Nebraska, took its name. The moment it came on screen, Chris not only recognized the wagon, but recognized the place. It's like, I've been there, I've lived there. So, so in seeing this, she brought it in, there was no other explanation than it just, it just popped up. Full screen. Uh, and, and she couldn't, after she'd seen it, she went off, it couldn't find it. It wasn't, it wasn't in the memory of her thing. It was, you could not find the page. It was like, so you kind of wake up and think something is happening here. Now, what was interesting is that I had just been looking the week before at another picture. And this was the picture I had been looking at the week before deliberately. So this didn't pop up on my screen. This was deliberate. Uh, now, the, the smiling little three, four-year-old there is Connie. <laughs> Beautiful. And this, this is the wagon called a Murphy wagon. You're learning some stuff. This is the wagon. Can you, do you recognize that piece of rock to the right? Okay. This is the wagon next to the wagon that Chris saw. So I was looking at this wagon with my little girl on, who actually at that time was the age that Joel was when we went to Scott's Bluff. The following week, she gets this other image, which is the wagon in Scott's Bluff. And you kind of think, unless you're really thick, something might be going on here. Now, what was also interesting is that I was wrestling with the message that we had on humility, on getting under, being poured into, how you receive. And I was wrestling with the message I brought to you last week uh, about altars and building the right kind of altars. And we come to those altars because those altars, I suggested to you, are places where we come to, to put a memorial to the goodness of God in our lives. They are places that we go and worship to remember that God was good to us and that was a place that we received from God. Well, these were altars for us. This, this is a place of, of worship, of worship for God and what he had done. So, cut a long story short, um, I was out, out studying a um, uh, few weeks ago when we were getting ready for our third part of the truth and not truth. And uh, I heard God speak to me as clear as I heard him speak to me the very first time that we ever set out on this, on this pilgrimage. And um, uh, God spoke to my heart so clearly and said, it's time to go on a pilgrimage. It's time to visit the place. It's time to worship at that altar of the prophetic word in your lives, of the proof of the goodness and faithfulness of God and of all that emerged from that to bring blessing, not only into our lives, but into the blessing of others and formed so much of the foundation of development for this house. And so, uh, you know, in, in, in the, I told Chris, and truth is within two days, we, we had booked flights and uh, everything, and it's organized. So um, what was also interesting was in this year of, of anniversaries, 
of uh, 25 years as a senior leader in this, this house, uh, me turning 60 in March of this year, us having our 40th wedding anniversary in September, but it's also the 30th anniversary of our pilgrimage to Scotts Bluff that formed so much of who we were for our future to this day. So I know God spoke very clearly to me, and so that's one of the reasons why we're not here Wednesday, Saturday, and Wednesday is because Chris and I will on Tuesday be flying out to go to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska um, to, to, to just do what God told us to do. He hasn't told us to go on a pilgrimage to Rome, you know, or to, or to a CC to study St. Francis or whatever. He's told us, go on a pilgrimage. We see it as a pilgrimage. It's a pil we're coming as pilgrims to be humble for God to pour in, to get low, to get under. So we've taken the step of faith to, 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 to get the tickets and get everything organized so that we can stand under what it is that, that, that God is doing and also to make sure that the altars for our life at this time are the right altars that we worship at. So all of this is formation, I believe, for... Uh, also moving towards October 1st um, when we want to say what we want to say and, and, and see where God is leading us in that whole process. So, so pray for us and believe for us and believe with us and you know we take some of your heart with us and you'll be part of our hearts but that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. And also, because of uh, what's been happening in, in, in my heart and our hearts about Salt Lake City, I saw in my head very clearly, it was like Denver, Scotts Bluff, Salt Lake, back to Denver. Now, that's significant for us. Even that, that triangle is significant. So we'll do Scotts Bluff, and then we are scooting off up to, um, up to Salt Lake, um, because I really believe we need to have some meetings there this year. Pray for us, just like Scott's Bluff, don't know anybody, nobody knows us really. I've made some connections with leaders, but what we need to do will be outside of that remit. So we're going we're gonna to also go through there. Uh, what's also interesting is it, it, it seems that uh, lots of things are pointing towards, towards uh, tattoo shops. That's a long story. But it's like, it would, not, it would not surprise me at all if we finish up meeting in a tattoo shop. Okay. Because uh, the greatest reception, the greatest openness, the greatest conversations I've had with anybody in Scotts Bluff have all been with tattoo artists. And there's a hunger and there's a need there in Salt Lake that, um, that there are hearts reaching out for God, but the system doesn't work for them. So pray for us. It's a pilgrimage. And when we come back, we'll, we'll tell you how we went on. So there you go. So, having said that, I, I felt I just needed to share something else with you, just, just for 10 minutes, okay? Because, um, well, one other thing on that, part, part of possessing the land, which, which, which I feel God spoke very clearly into my spirit, is in Genesis 13, verse 17, God said to Abraham, who he told to go into a land that he didn't possess, he told him to go and walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So, so God was giving him a land, but part of the, part of the covenant process was you've got to walk the length and breadth of it. So you might say, why do you need to go? Because we need to walk the length and breadth of the land that God is giving to us, okay? That's part of the promise that was there. But I also wanted just to share with you something that is important, because ever since our days in Scotts Bluff, there has been a principle that was um, you get ingrained in you because of where you are. Scotts Bluff, Nebraska is, uh, is a major stop-off point on what was known as the Oregon Trail, which was the major route that the American pioneers took in their journey from east to populate the west. And uh, Scotts Bluff was one of the places they passed through, and right where you saw those wagons is where they made a pass called the Mitchell Pass through, through the rocks at Scotts Bluff for them to go through. One thing you could see when we were still there, but in the last 30 years, the weather has um, gradually eroded the soft stone that was there, but we could still witness them, was, was, was the wagons that went through, those, those kind of wagons that went through thousands of pioneers, uh, created ruts in the road, deep ruts. And uh, 30 years ago, you could see them. They've leveled out a little bit now. 
So when you, whenever you went there and looked, one thing you were consciously aware of is that with the greatest of vision and purpose, your life can still end up in a rut. And I think this connects partly to Chris and I's journey because you can have a journey of faith, you can have a journey of ministry, you can have a journey of the church, and uh, you can still finish up in a rut. So for a few minutes, I just wanted to talk to you about being stuck in a rut. See, any repetitive activity or process or behavior or belief leaves us vulnerable to the possibility of getting stuck in a rut. And once you're in a rut, the wheels of your life simply follow the direction determined by the rut without any real effort from yourself. It takes no effort to stay in a rut. In your belief, in your action, in your activity, whatever, in your processes, it takes no effort to stay in a rut. In fact, if we just keep repeating our behaviors, our thoughts, our beliefs, our actions, our activities, then we will never get out of the rut that we are in. In fact, the process of nature is that the rut gets deeper. So not all, the problem doesn't even stay the same. The problem of being in a rut gets worse. And then we have all the experiences that led us to have this wonderful colloquialism in English that says, I'm in a rut, which is very deep language for saying, I'm in a rut. And we get stuck in ruts in our lives, in all these different areas. Now, nobody should be fooled. Breaking out of a rut is one of the most difficult maneuvers you will ever attempt. Which is why the path often did not vary, because you couldn't get off the path that you were on because the ruts were too deep. That might be your life tonight. It might be your experience. It might, it might be your spiritual journey. It might be your natural journey. It might be that in your life, all that's happening is the ruts are getting deeper because breaking out of a rut is one of the most difficult maneuvers you'll ever attempt. The truth is that to get out of a rut, you have to engage a faith that will drive you up and over the lip of your rut into a new direction. You have to engage a faith that will drive you up and over the lip of your rut in order for you to get into a new direction. It's not going to happen by chance. It's not going to happen by default. In fact, somebody once said, talking about ruts, that if you go long enough in a rut, what you do is you dig your own grave and your rut becomes your grave. And we don't ever get you out. We just fill you in and put a stone over, and say this was a lovely person, I thought they would have made it different, but this is just an epitaph. They dug, dug their own grave by the very rut that they were creating, by an unwillingness to engage your faith to drive them up and over the lip of their rut into a new direction. See, you'll never go in a new direction without a new belief. That's one of the reasons knowing God and the Bible is so important. Now, we've not pushed you or pressured you to say, you know, you have to read a Bible verse a day or whatever. So, some of you have robbed yourself because you never bother. And some would say, well, is it necessary um, to know the Bible in order to engage your faith that drives you up and over the lip? Well, I, I could argue and say, how else are you going to know about the one who you have the faith in who has the power to help you to drive up and over the lip? So I believe one of the major reasons for seeking to know God and to know the Bible is so you can go in a new direction because you develop a new belief. We're trying to get you into a new belief. But you'll never develop a, be a new belief without engaging faith. See, for all of us, developing a new belief requires us to engage faith because it's a different belief and we don't move easily or readily into different beliefs without a step of faith. And the one thing we don't like is 
faith, because faith means you have to make a leap into something between here and there, and in the middle there's nothing to hold on to. When you jump from a rock to a rock, you're making a leap of faith because there's nothing in the middle. What frightens us is the bit in the middle. It frightens us being out of control. But the way to get out of a rut is determined by our willingness to have a new belief, and that is governed by our willingness to engage into faith. That faith that I'm talking about must be the determined placement of belief and trust in a different outcome, saturated with the goodness and faithfulness of God. Chances are, if you're not believing for a different outcome, you won't get a different outcome. Because you'll get what you're believing for. And for most of us in the difficult places of life, we get really angry, but we're actually getting what we believe for. We believe that that's how this will pan out. And funnily enough, that's how it pans out. We believe we'll be rejected. We believe we'll never have anybody. We believe nobody will want us. We believe our life is rubbish. And lo and behold, day after day, we prove that our belief is right. See, faith gives us an opportunity to make a determination to place our belief and trust in a different outcome. The Bible is all about placing your faith and trust in a different outcome. Our lives should not be governed by what we see with the natural eye. Our lives should be governed by faith in what God sees about our situation and we begin to engage with the wonder and the miracle of that because what God plans is always good and it's always faithful. And of course, in with that comes a hope. You know what I say about hope. Hope is the confident expectation that the last word has not yet been spoken. I want to get you out of a rut tonight. But you've got to believe something different. You've got to have the faith that's going to suddenly drive you up the side of your rut. And over, once you're over the lip, you're going in a new direction. That's the problem, getting over the lip that has bound you in. And that's what intimidates us and threatens us. It looks like a mountain, and we need to get past the mountain. And it's going to take faith and a new belief to get you over that lip. But once you're out of that lip of the rut, the truth is you're on a clear road, and your direction does not have to be governed by the rut that you found yourself in. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I can't believe that I'm reading to you tonight the very verse that I talked about on the night that we met here before Chris and I went to Scott's Bluff, about now faith, faith that is now. But what it does, listen, it makes substance of what we hope for. It brings evidence of the things not seen. That therefore means that there are things not seen. Faith evidences the things not seen. The things not seen are the things that God speaks into the situation, that He, from His point of view, establishes. Faith makes substance of what we could only hope for and evidences that which is not seen. When you're in a rut, the stuff that you're not seeing. But as you begin to engage faith, you begin to see what you were not seeing. See, I'm not the only one that God wants to turn up to and say, okay, here's the deal. And you begin to see what cannot be seen. Faith releases us into that dimension. I dare you to believe Romans 10 verse 17 says this, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I'm not here to teach at length on this. I would put it this way. Faith comes when you hear what God says about you and your situation. Did you get that? Faith comes when you hear what God says about you and your situation. So what is your job? To strive and put in effort and, and attempt by your own strength? No, your job 
is simply to engage a place of faith where you realize you need to be poured into and faith will come when you hear what God says about you and your situation. Faith came to Chris and I to pick up our little boy and our suitcases and disappear to a place that wasn't waiting for us but we were waiting for it. Faith made us do that because when faith happens, something is about what God says about you and your situation. I'm choosing you, I'm sending you, I'm gonna use you, I trust you, and suddenly in here something rises that you go over the lip of the rut. Now you gotta bear in mind, we were hometown kids, okay? Lived at home, raised at home, same church as our parents, still active with our parents, never really been and done anything on our own. Even when we got married, Chris will tell you that wasn't that wasn't necessarily uh, freedom from that. Something happened to get us over a rut of something in our life, over that edge. And that's what God wants to do with you today. Faith comes when you hear what God says about you and your situation. If it's destruction and doom and, and, and lack and loss, it ain't God. John put it this way, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life in all its fullness. Okay? So what are you hearing? Because one bunch of stuff ain't God. Now, I don't think most of the time it's the devil, if there is a devil. I think most of it is our simple human weakness that looks at our situation. We don't think we can solve it, so we start making the rut, and we start believing what we believe, and we get exactly what we believe for, and then we can't get out of the rut. But I believe tonight there is a power and a strength to help you to be driven up over the lip of the rut into a new direction, and that's your willingness to hear what God is saying about you and your situation. And he says, hey, come on, this is it, let's do it. So just a couple more things. With the greatest of promise, you can still finish up going round in circles and deepening your rut. Very briefly, children of Israel, captivity in Egypt, Cruel, desperate, difficult, suffering. And they come out of Egypt and they have to cross the desert to get to the land where all the promise that is hanging over them exists. There's promise hanging over your life. You just need to get to that place where promise is hanging over your life. But guess what happened? It should have taken 11 days. That stretched to two years and that stretched to 40 years because they were going round in circles. They had the greatest of promise, but still finished up going round in circles and deepening their rut. You can be sat in here tonight with the greatest of promise hanging over your life, but still go round in the same old circles while deepening your rut. It took a crossing over to break them out. From Egypt, it took a crossing over the Red Sea. From the desert, it took a crossing over, the River Jordan. In other words, you have to make a crossing over. You have to get over the lip of the rut. Once you get over the lip of the rut, you're in a new world. Even the desert was amazing because of God's presence because they got over the lip and out of the rut of Egypt. And when they got over the lip of the rut that they had created in the desert into the land of promise, it was amazing. I believe what God wants for our lives is amazing and what God wants for you is amazing. You need a breakout, you need a crossing over or if you've tramped your rut so deep that it's now become your grave, you need a resurrection. But whether you need a breakout, a crossing over or a resurrection, the good news is God is good at all of those. (laughs) He's good at all of them. Breakouts, crossing overs, resurrections. He's done them all and he's done them well and he's made them work for people just like you and me. My question to you is, will you come to the place of faith tonight? Will you come to a place where you believe God is for you and that as you get a hold of who he is 
and who he is to you and for you and who you are in him, you get a boost to get over that lip and the opportunity tonight to begin to live in a different direction, a determined placement of your belief and trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God, knowing that the last word has not yet been spoken and your rut doesn't need to be your grave, okay? It can be your launching place to a new life. I believe it in Jesus' name. Bow your heads just for one moment. I can't do anything with your faith. I hope for some of you faith has come as you've heard the word of God tonight because faith comes as we hear what God is saying. For some of you, just a few embers might have started to build and say, oh, it would be lovely if that would happen for me. Well, it can happen for you and it will happen for you if you'll take that little bit of faith now and instead of staying in your rut, say, right, this is it. I, I, I'm launching out of the rut because now I'm choosing to believe that the goodness and the faithfulness of God are over my life and that he has spoken something into me that can change my course and change my direction and that now I choose to put my faith in the goodness of God, his love towards me and his ability to lift me out, his ability to speak to me, to show me what's not seen so that I can begin to live with a new image of him, myself, and the world. So if that's you tonight, I'm not going to ask you to stand tonight. But I want you to pray this little prayer in your heart. Pray it with me, okay? Lord, tonight I put every bit of the faith that I can muster in you. I refuse to to have my life dictated by the circumstances that have been what has constructed it for so long. I know that I've got in a rut, but I know tonight with your help and by your grace and through faith, I can get over the lip of that rut and go in a new direction. I choose by faith in you and because of the resurrection power of Jesus, to break the power of death, to come out of that rut tonight and begin to live in a new direction. Help me to see your grace at every step. Help me to see your goodness in every step. Help me to feel your life in every step. For I declare this day in my life the day that I got out of the rut and began to walk in the promise that you have for my life. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. And some of you might say it's just words. Yeah, it is. Thank God for just words. Because somebody once just said to you, you're rubbish. Somebody once just said to you, you can't do this. Somebody once just said to you, you're not a nice person. They just said it. Well, we just said something. Just words, just words. There's power in just words. And part of faith coming as we hear the word of God is we take those words that we hear God speak and we make those words our words. And as we make those words our words, what you're saying, God is saying. So when we started at the beginning and started singing, David, the great king of Israel, said, when he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, he was realizing that when he spoke words that were initiated by God through faith, it would change what happened in his life. You're speaking too many of your words and not enough of his words. His words brought the universe into being so they can change your life. They can change your circumstance, and the truth is they will. And so I put those two things together because the ruts and the journey are all part of that same process to bring us to a place of faith, to say, God, we're coming out of a rut. 
And if we as a church are in a rut, we're going over the lip by faith. Every one of us individually, personally, corporately, that's where we're going because God is God. So we love you, we appreciate you, and uh, find somewhere to be next Saturday. And uh, take some steps of faith this week. And and don't live as a rut person because you're out of the rut, okay? Live as a free person. Thank God for your freedom. Say, Jesus, just lead me now. Now I've got a chance to go in another direction, free from the rut that I was in. Just guide my every step. Lead me all the way. And help me to keep hearing what you're saying and saying what you're saying rather than what I'm saying about me. Amen. Okay, we're done. Bless you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>